Gage Kramar here, crushbackpain.com. Today we're going to talk about cervical herniated discs. We've spent quite a bit of time on the lumbar spine and lumbar herniated discs, and I've had some questions on cervical herniated discs. So first things first, the cervical spine set up a little, little different than the lumbar spine. So there's, there's five discs, and you can see here these white bones are the vertebrae, and then these little gray cushions in between are the discs. The first disc is between C2 and C3. There's not a disc in between the occiput, in between the skull and C1. So you've got five cervical discs. And the first thing to note is that the cervical discs have less fluid content than lumbar discs. So when we're born at birth, the cervical disc is about 25% nucleus pulposus and 75% annulus fibrosus. So the nucleus pulposus, the disc is made up of uh, primarily two parts. The nucleus pulposus, which is the inside, viscous, kind of watery, wet part, and then the outside annulus fibrosus that holds that nucleus pulposus in. So the disc is made out of those two parts. 25% of the disc is nucleus pulposus, the inside fluid-filled part, and then 75% is the annulus fibrosus, the part that holds it in, in the cervical spine. In the lumbar spine, it's 50-50. So in the lumbar spine, 50% is that nucleus pulposus and 50% is the annulus fibrosus. So in the cervical spine, you're starting with less fluid content in the disc. Also in the cervical spine, about 25% of the height of the cervical spine from top to bottom comes from the disc, and that's more so than in the lumbar spine. What that does is it allows for greater range of motion. So when we're up walking around and moving our head, we need a lot of range so we can, we can take in visual information and process that. And that's why you have greater disc height compared to vertebrae height in the cervical spine compared to the lumbar spine. So greater disc height compared to vertebrae height and less fluid content. Now, as we age, the fluid content of the nucleus pulposus, the inside of the disc, actually decreases faster in the cervical spine than the lumbar spine. Usually in the third decade, we start to see that, that fluid content decrease. By the fourth decade, almost everybody is going to have some evidence of what we call degenerative changes of the cervical spine on MRI. That doesn't mean anything is wrong with the cervical spine. They're just age-related changes. And all, it, all the MRIs really show when you're in your 40s is that fluid content of the cervical disc decreasing. And as that fluid content decreases, the cervical disc actually gets a little smaller in height. When that happens, there's more, there's more force put through the cervical facet joints and the uncovertebral joints. So as we age, the disc becomes less fluid filled and more, more force is put through the facet joints and the uncovertebral joints of the cervical spine. That said, the cervical disc does still herniate and with herniation, there's a bunch of different symptoms that can manifest. It can just be neck pain. You can have a herniation that irritates the nerve roots. You can have arm pain. You can even have a herniation that gets into the, the space where the spinal cord is and pushes on that spinal cord, and you can have what they call a myelopathy, where you have some different symptoms, some balance impairments, even lower extremity, a weakness, things like that. So cervical disc herniations do occur, and you know, the question is, do they heal? Do they heal like lumbar discs? There is evidence in the medical literature of what we term spontaneous regression or spontaneous resorption of cervical discs. It's not as well documented in the cervical spine as it is in the lumbar spine, and that's for several reasons. In the cervical spine, you're starting with less fluid on the inside of the disc. That fluid is what herniates out and, uh, and irritates nerve roots and, and causes quite a bit of pain. So you have less fluid to begin with, and the cervical spine is just like the lumbar spine. The discs that are the most likely to under undergo spontaneous regression are the discs that have an extruded nucleus pulposus or, or a completely sequestered nucleus pulposus where it comes out of the annulus fibrosus and is out there where the body kind of attacks it and it gets rid of it. Those are the discs, those more severe herniations that have the, the greatest likelihood of undergoing spontaneous regression. And this holds for the lumbar spine and the cervical spine. So in the cervical spine, you have that 
happen less frequently because there's less fluid content to begin with. And it's, it's just not as well documented, but it is documented. It does happen. That said, in the cervical spine, you can have herniated discs that aren't sequestered. And they're not completely extruded. So the disc bulges, but that inside is, is still held in place by the outside of the disc, by the annulus fibrosis. And those discs, just like in the lumbar spine, are less likely to undergo spontaneous regression or spontaneous reabsorption. So on MRI, you can have that herniation that shows up you know, when you have the MRI and years later, it still shows up, but you can be asymptomatic. That's, that's what you need to remember. So the disc herniation may still be there, but you don't necessarily have symptoms. Disc herniations can become asymptomatic. So the question is, do, do cervical herniated discs heal like lumbar discs? Yes, they heal. And when I say heal, they become asymptomatic and you have full range of motion. You don't have any restrictions. You can do what you want. Do they, do they have the same rate of spontaneous regression, spontaneous resorption? No, and it's not as well documented in the literature. That said, there is documentation case studies in the literature that show spontaneous regression of extruded cervical herniated discs. So it does occur, it's just not as frequent in the cervical spine compared to the lumbar spine. Another, another take home point with with cervical herniated discs that you want to bear in mind is that generally the prognosis is very favorable. So when you look at like large groups of people, a lot of people that have a herniated cervical disc with radiculopathy, which is just a term that means arm pain, that's due to the disc herniation in the neck. When you look at people that have that problem, 83% of those people get better. And from time from onset to when they get substantial relief, it's generally four to six months with anywhere from 24 months to 36 months, so two to three years before complete resolution of symptoms happens. And this is with you know, conservative treatment, meaning they don't go undergo, they don't have surgery, they don't have any, any major medical procedures done. So 83% of the time, when you have those symptoms, a cervical herniated disc with arm pain, 83% of the time, those symptoms are going to get better, noticeably better within four to six months with complete resolution of symptoms within two to three years. So the prognostic, the prognostic course of cervical herniated discs is, is positive, just like with the lumbar spine. So the take home points, yes, cervical discs become asymptomatic. Yes, they heal. Healing, meaning you have full range of motion, you don't have any restrictions, and you're pain free. Does spontaneous regression occur? Yes. It's only documented with, with extruded discs in the cervical spine. In the lumbar spine, it's documented with everything from herniated to protruded to extruded to sequestered. It's just a lot more common in the uh, extruded and sequestered discs. In the cervical spine, just documented with extruded nucleus pulposus. So it does happen just less frequently. Like we discussed, you're starting with less fluid in the cervical nucleus pulposus compared to the lumbar spine. 25% of the cervical disc is nucleus pulposus compared to 50% of the lumbar spine. So there's less fluid to actually extrude and herniate out of the outer, the outer part of the disc. So those are, those are the things that you need to know with regards to cervical herniations. Uh, down below, I put some links to papers that you can look at. You can check out the medical literature and, and see what I'm talking about here. And you can read up on cervical disc herniations on your own and, and see kind of what you think. If you have any questions, let me know. If this video helped you, leave me a thumbs up below. And check back every week for proven methods to beat back pain permanently.